thank you very much and thank you for coming today on this beautiful day. Um, so the title of my presentation today is Parlez-vous Francais? I'm sure you all know this um, question and thanks to technology, I do. Um, here's a little outline of what I will be doing today. First, I will talk a little bit about the theory of why I'm using technology in a foreign language classroom. Then we'll go into application of this use of technology in the foreign language, language classroom and we will try to do a technologically enhanced full immersion, maybe not so full, but some sort of immersion lesson in French foods and then I'll go on to a little conclusion. So, um, I believe that I would be preaching um, to the choir if I were to emphasize the importance of learning a language to today's audience. Since all of you have decided to come to this presentation, it is obvious that you're interested in languages and in the 21st century's ways of acquiring fluency in a world language. Just to reinforce your opinion and reassure you in your support of language learning, here are a few new facts um, of which you may not be aware. The first one is that, um, as reported in the Language Educator of January 2011, a publication by the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, which is ACTFL for short, for short um, a study conducted by Canadian scientists has proven that bilingualism delays the onset of Alzheimer's by years. And another study conducted by the National Foreign Language Center at the University of Maryland in collaboration with the Council of Chief State School Officers has showed that 23 of 25 other industrialized countries and emerging powers <coughs> mandate a study, the study, of a second language to begin before the age of 12, while in the United States in the academic year 2008-2009, only 12 states required the study of a world language at any point during a student's schooling throughout K-12, and the majority of these requirements were for high school. The US is consequently behind all world powers in language learning. The reason why all these nations emphasize language learning is because languages are an asset in any career at this point. One cannot rely on English only when going abroad to negotiate or simply visit another country. If one really wants to understand the culture of the place that is visited, one needs to be able to speak the language <coughs> spoken there. Learning a second language, a foreign language, is not so easy as some of you may have experienced already. Although for some people, it is an easier task than for others. So the challenge of language professors is to tailor their programs to those for whom learning a language is not second nature. In this presentation, I will show you a few techniques I use in my French classroom to make language learning as productive as possible for being a class taken to fulfill a language requirement. Okay, as professors, we all think that our subject matter is unique. Now you're gonna say that, um, I will say that French is the most unique, but I'm not gonna say that. What I will say though, is that what is rather special about language learning in general is that it can be learned without schooling, even without lessons. As stated in the Standards for Foreign Language Learning in the 21st Century, a publication by ACTFL, same association as before, there we go, all children all over the world, unless they have some sort of neurological disorder, are typically fluent in their first language by age five. They gain control of various components of language for competent use long before the emergence of cognitive skills that will be necessary for school learning, and they seemingly learn it naturally, that is, without conscious effort. Interestingly, and I quote, much of the same sort of natural learning can occur when children acquire a second language, end of quote. Of course, as college professors, we do not deal with children, I think, but with adults. However, even for older language learners and all of my colleagues in languages will agree with me, I hope, the same type of natural learning without formal instruction is possible by going to the country where the language one uh, wants to learn is spoken. 
This natural learning is specific to languages, as one would not say that the best way to learn math is to hang out in the math department with mathematicians, or the best way to learn um, studio art is exposure to professional artists, or even the best way to learn social studies is to live in the society. Unfortunately, not everybody can take at least a year from their studies or profession to go and live abroad totally immersed in the language they want to learn. I say a year because it is the strict minimum in full immersion to acquire an average level of fluency. Living abroad is expensive, family responsibilities can prevent us from being able to do so, fear of flying can be a handicap in reaching a faraway destination, and the excuses go on. Thankfully, foreign language professors are right here at home for your benefit to save the world and educate everyone in not only another language, but also another culture, another way of life, another world. With this in mind, the challenge of the foreign language classroom is to reproduce the natural environment in which people learn languages naturally. So students learn to use the target language for real communication, <clears throat> meaning a process that involves speaking and understanding what others say in the target language, as well as reading and interpreting written materials. Acquiring communicative competency also involves um, the acquisition of increasingly complex concepts centering on the relationship between culture and communication. In order to reach this goal of real communication, foreign language professors discover the challenge of recreating an environment similar to the one in which one learns his or her native language. This means transforming or transporting our language classroom into the actual country where the, where the target language is spoken. How does one do that? I guess relying on Star Trek and their teletransportation system is one option. But to be more realistic, uh, maybe, even in, in the 21st century, is to rely on what I call the four tools. The first tool is to use full language immersion in the classroom. Students are immersed in their native language all day long. They are exposed to the target language in the classroom and uh, while doing their homework only, and possibly by practicing as soon as they get a chance with their professor outside of class, with native speakers who may happen to be studying abroad in the United States, or by going to weekly conversation hours organized by the school. Besides these very few options, the target language is often lost in the sea of English being spoken around. This is why keeping a full immersion environment in the classroom is the first tool to help students acquire reflexes in the target language. The problem with this technique is that it is rather artificial and adult learners feel self-conscious about their accents, making mistakes, etc elements that do not matter much when one is abroad and has to, no other choice but say something or ask a question in the target language if they want to be understood and have their needs met. Also, as adult learners, we like to analyze and translate what we hear into our own language. Instead of accepting a sentence in its entirety for its meaning, we examine the way it is constructed and what each word means exactly in our native tongue. Children do not learn languages this way. They rely on context clues. Positive reinforcement from the professor in these situations is the best asset one has. Rewarding full immersion from the student's part works extremely well. One can give extra credit points, for example, um, or full participation points for the class in which they respected the full immersion rule fully. The second tool is to be aware of standards um, for learning foreign languages developed by the ACTFL and other language associations, and keep in mind the five C's developed by um, ACTFL to help nurture this natural environment while we teach. The five C's and how they relate to French learning are, the first one is communication, and as it relates to French, it's communicate in French. The second C is cultures, 
and for French, so gain knowledge and understanding of the cultures of the Francophone world. Francophone means everything, every country that, that speaks French. Um, the third C is connections. So in this case, use French to connect with other disciplines and expand knowledge. The fourth one is comparisons. Develop insights through French into the nature of language and culture. And the fifth one is communities. Use French to participate in communities at home and around the world. The third tool is technology. In the past, speaking the language was not as important as re reading it. But today, more effort is done to engage students in more productive activities, resulting in better communication skills. A way to do this is to integrate more technology in the language classroom, such as digital media like songs, um, the internet, websites, or Skype. I will talk about that later. Um, software, such as the Rosetta Stone that you probably know of, and um, even PowerPoint like I'm using today. That's definitely technology. Um, the AATF, or American Association of Teachers of French, created a specific section on their website where professors can get monthly ideas on how to use different technologies in their classrooms. It is entitled the AATF Telematics and New Technologies Commission. The ACTFL also presents articles on how to use technology in class on their websites, and their yearly conference offers many sessions on the use of technology to enhance teaching and learning in the foreign language classroom. Thanks to technology, the world can be transported into our classroom. The internet, movies, songs, pictures on the PowerPoint slide, and more allow us to bring elements students would encounter if they were abroad into Gamble Hall. Isn't that amazing? And then the fourth tool are the people whom we are asked to teach on a daily basis, the millennials. They are not a new group of aliens. Millennials is the name given to the current generation of our students. According to Neil Howie, is it Howie? How? You tell me. And um, William Strauss, um, they are the generation born in or after 1982. These are students who do not know what life is without a caller TV, a cell phone, GPS, or the internet. Information is just a click away from their bed, their kitchen, or their car. They have a fascination for and a mastery of new technologies. Again, according to Howie and Strauss, I'm going to call him Howie, why not? Um, nearly three in four eight to 12 year olds use computers, outdistancing older teens and adults alike. They're also a generation of children who are rewarded for good be behavior and are used to collaborative learning. When questioned about the effectiveness of their professors in college, most of them reply that they get easily bored in classrooms that are not interactive, um, that are only lecture type, and or that do not use technology. They need to be stimulated in class as they are at home and rewarded for their efforts. And this is where our challenge comes in. What the millennials may not know is that, luckily, technology has proven to be a tool that new research shows works well in the language classroom to achieve students' fluency and their ability to actually communicate in the language learned that work better than the translation-based techniques from the 1950s. Now, the millennials cannot get full credit for our integration of technology in the classroom. Indeed, another reason why the use of technology has developed so much in the past decades is that as foreign language professors, our goal is to have a student-centered classroom, which is a challenge in itself because for many, as Robert J. Blake states in his work, Brave New Digital Classroom Technology and Foreign Language Learning, the student-centered classroom predictably blurs the traditional roles of authority and expertise, and for most teachers, that's a disturbing feeling. 
Integrating technology properly into the curriculum helps create an environment in which all students become producers and listeners of the target language for a much longer amount of time during each class period than if technology was not used. For example, students in a live chat with native speakers can get one-on-one, -on -one, so personal practice and feedback, for a whole class period something that is impossible when teaching a class of 25 with only one professor. And especially, while in a conversation with a native speaker, they can get authentic cultural information instantaneously as they practice the target language. Overall, to create a language learning experience that is efficient and as close to natural language learning as possible, I believe that full immersion keeping our audience in mind and the use of technology in the classroom are essential tools. Okay, so now we go to our second part of um, the uh, presentation and Lee will distribute a little handout. One side of the handout is the outline of this part of the presentation and on the other side are words with fill in the blanks kind of song. Uh, it's an activity that we will do a little bit later on. So I'll wait until everybody has their handout. And while everybody is getting their handout, um, so the first part of language learning is acquiring new vocabulary. Um, so today, because everybody loves French food, we're going, we're going to do a lesson on French foods, okay? So let's just do a little bit of brainstorming and can you tell me a few items that you can find in your local Kroger that are French items that you actually you may not know, but maybe you think that they are French. So can you list a few? Wine. wine. How do you say wine in French? Vin. Vin. Très bien. <laughs> Croissant. Croissant. Very good. Croissant, vin. Fromage. fromage. What's fromage? Cheese. Okay, so give me a couple examples of fromage. Le boursin, le brie. Okay, camembert maybe. Camembert. Okay, very good. So here's a list I made. Um, so croissant, you listed that one. Baguette. Nobody said baguette. Uh, brie. People listed brie and camembert cheeses. Um, une crème could be whatever, like sour cream, would be crème, you know, épaisse or something. Um, un sandwich, that's very French, because it has un in front of it, so it makes it French. Un café, also very French. And then une bouteille de vin, I put a bottle of wine. All right, so after... Um, so that's, that may be a first part of a lesson where I would ask students to come up with cognates, which are words that are this, the same in English and in French, and, or that look the same and that mean the same. For example, crème means cream, okay? Uh, is there an, un sandwich, obviously, that's sandwich, right? So I would ask them to come up with cognates like that. And then um, I would have, uh, so, uh, I'm going to show you a couple more examples of cognates right here. So les carottes, everybody knows what that is, right? Okay. Le brocoli, yes, okay. Le chocolat, who doesn't know what that is? And les bananes. Okay, so here are a few cognates. Um, so one way to present this new vocabulary would be to use props. It's always good to have a few plastic bananas in your drawer. Um, or you can use PowerPoint slides where you show the image of a banana and then you say, une banane, and then you know, students would repeat or whatever. Um, another way to uh, practice or get acquired this new vocabulary is to use software such as the Rosetta Stone. Have you heard of the Rosetta Stone? So um, hopefully the technology will cooperate with me and we're going to um, the Rosetta Stone website where you can test it first to see if you like the technique and if you like it then you can pay the $800 um, to get the license or um, if you're a foreign language student at Armstrong you can use the lab 
uh, we do have uh, French, Spanish, and German uh, Rosetta Stone, levels one, two, and three for French, German, Spanish, one, two, three, four, and five in Spanish. So hopefully this will work. You select your language, maybe not. I'll put this first. Ah, okay, so we'll do French and then launch the demo. And so it's an image and sound association. They don't explain anything. Um, they just give you images and they say what the images are. And then, you know, you, you speak it and you have to pick the files that best represent what they're saying and things like that. So you would repeat, repeat. Now they say une femme, and you have to click on the image that represents une femme. So which one is it? This one on the left or this one on the right? right. On the right. Yes! <laughs> now they say un homme, and what do you do? You click on the guy. Yes! Okay, now we go to the part that's interesting. Sorry, this is interesting too, but... We go to the food slides, which, which are the interest, interesting slides. Okay, so they say, de la salade, de la salade. Okay, sorry, we're going to do this one again, because I was too high. Is it working? Okay, never mind. So I will do the voice. De la salade, de la salade. And then there's a blank thing where, and you have three little images on top. Can you see what they are? Okay, so which one is de la salade? The middle one. The middle one. Let's see if you're right. Of course, it's not going to work now. Ah, you're right. De la salade. Du poisson is what? What do you think? Du poisson. Okay. So where do we have fish up there? We have this, this, or this. First? Yes. Ah, de la soupe. So we used this one, it was du poisson. We used this one, it was de la salade. So we have this one that's left. Does it look like de la soupe? Yes. And we are correct again. You are excellent uh, students for sure. OK. Okay, so it goes on to sentences. It's really well done, and it's very interactive, just like I do with my child. I don't tell her, this is the bottle, c'est une bouteille, right? I just say, voilà, la bouteille, you know, prends la bouteille, bois, whatever, and she understands without me explaining what it means. All right, so that's acquiring vocabulary. Um, if you're acquiring vocabulary with a professor in the classroom, uh, you can get instantaneous feedback as to uh, your pronunciation. But if you're working on your own, if you're at home and you're not um, sure of how to pronounce a word anymore, then there are other options that you can use than call your professor in the middle of the night with a crisis because you don't know how to pron pronounce croissant. So you go um, in, the, in, our, in our lab in Gamble Hall, we have a digital lab called Sanaco, and um, you can have a recording of all the words, and it shows you the line of the voice, you know, how the accent should be. And so when you say it and the lines are similar, you know you're saying it right. And if, you're, if your curves are not the same, then you know you're not saying it right, and you try to correct yourself. But another site that is very um, fun, it's called virtualfrenchtutor.com. And we're going to go there. And what you do is you type the word, and there's this man, and he looks very robotic, and his mouth opens and closes. Or, or the lady. There's a lady, too. But there's a guy on the other side. There he is. And so I don't remember how to say salad. Salad, I don't remember how to say salad. So I do salad and speak. Salad. Ah, salad. And you can do it again. Salad. salad. And so you repeat it, and it's a very nice tool. Any words you don't know how to pronounce in French? Anyone wants to try? Car. Car? 
Okay, so first we need to translate it because we don't know what it is. Translator. Okay, and then speak it. Voiture. He has to think first, you know, and it's normal. <laughs> okay, so that's how you can check your pronunciation. Then, after you have acquired vocabulary, the next thing is that you need to be able to use this vocabulary, otherwise there is no point in learning it. So an activity that I would do with my students is that I would have them make their shopping list. Um, they they want to go to the supermarket, or supermarché, right? And um, they write down the list of things that they want to buy, or supermarché. They don't write their name on the piece of paper, but they do write you know, quantities also, like un camembert, one camembert, deux bananes, you know, two bananas, whatever. And when they've made their list, I give them a couple minutes, I um, collect all of the papers, and I redistribute them to different people, then they have to get up, um, and they have to find the author of, of the shopping list. And so they ask a very simple question, which is, est-ce que, are you, tu vas, Acheter, you go, are you going to buy? And then whatever is on the piece of paper. Um, and so if the person says, yes, I will buy whatever you just said, then they continue down the list because some people, maybe two people will be buying milk, right? So they have to find the person, um, the exact person that wrote the list. So this is my shopping list. Un camembert, and I will ask you to repeat after me. Un camembert. Un, camembert. Un ananas. De pamplemousse. De pamplemousse. I'm sure there are things you don't know what they mean. Camembert, you know. Ananas? Pineapple. Pineapple. Pamplemousse? Grapefruit. Grapefruit, excellent. Une soupe du jour. Repeat, une soupe du jour. Okay. Trois steaks de bœuf. Trois steaks de bœuf. You understand, oui? Okay. Quatre croissants. Okay. Un sandwich. Un sandwich. Une baguette. Une baguette. Un, café. Un café. Un thé. Un, thé. Un, chocolat chaud. Un chocolat chaud. Un jus d'orange. Un, jus d'orange. Un, verre de vin. Un verre de vin. I was obviously thirsty when I made my shopping list. Okay, and then they ask. Those questions. Est-ce que tu vas acheter un camembert? Est-ce que tu vas acheter un ananas? And then they find their, um, their counterpart. Then, this is one way to practice the new vocabulary, but then they also have to recognize this, those words, those new words they have acquired when other people from the media pronounce them. It's harder than when someone is in front of you. It's harder to, especially on the radio, to hear really what people are saying on the TV or, you know, if there's an image, it's a little bit easier because you can see the lip movement. But when it's a song, it's a little bit more complicated. So now, just pretend you've acquired a lot of French vocabulary about food, and we're going to écouter la chanson, and then you notez on your nice handout, orange and handout, uh, les mots qui manquent, so note the missing words, and ooh, I um, put some words in there that were maybe not on my shopping list. But remember, un, deux, trois, quatre. Okay, repeat after me. Un, deux, trois, quatre. Okay, and then I'm sure you will, um, f- you will remember the other words when you hear them. There are a couple of words I didn't mention because they are words that any American should know in French. So I didn't say them yet, but you'll find them. I'm sure you will. So this is a song. Now, it's not a real song, okay? But it's fun. Okay, I'll stop it here. Maybe, okay. 
So I, I, could you hear? Because I can't hear anything from here. So you couldn't hear very well. Okay. Well, I'm not going to replay it because it would take too much time. But I'm sure you've heard a couple things. At least I hope. Um, what was the first word he said? Did, did you hear that? Oui. Croissant. Je voudrais un croissant. And then both of them say, with the big bread, they say une baguette, ha, 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 whatever they say. Okay. And then uh, le voyage, so the trip to the supermarché, to trip to the supermarket. And so they put all kinds of things in their um, cart. And the first thing is pamplemousse, ananas, okay. They, they, but there was boeuf at some point, yes. Jus d'orange is next. Then boeuf. They, I mean, they are not French, so <laughs> their pronunciation is interesting. Um, then soup du jour. Then there was Jacques Cousteau. Or, or the, the fish, well, it's a joke, right? So the camembert, baguette, and I think that was it. Oh, then there is a little conversation. And the guy says, bonjour. And then she says, bonjour. And then he says, or she says, bonjour again. And then she says, ça va? Ça va? Ça va? Ça va? Very difficult conversation. Ça va means, how are you? Or how's it going? And then, very complicated, when the trees come up on the picture, he was counting. Did you get that? He, w he said, un, deux, un, deux, trois, quatre. So that's what it was. And the very last question that she asks him, what is it? Parlez-vous français? And she makes a mistake herself. She doesn't say, parlez-vous français. She says, parlez-vous le français, which is not right. You shouldn't say that. It's parlez-vous français. Um, and he says, no. Well, and he, she says it twice. Okay, so that's a fun song with food vocabulary to be used in um, the lesson with food. Then, uh, and I know that time is progressing, so I will uh, maybe shortcut a little bit what's coming up, but then um, to use a little bit more technology, I would then pretend that I am Luc Besson, who is a French filmmaker, and that I am here at Armstrong doing a casting for my next film, and you are my students, uh, and you are writers uh, for scripts, right, for my new film. And you have to write a script or a mini dialogue for a conversation that happens in a cafe between a waiter and a client. And so, for example, I always give an example. That's a really mini dialogue. So the server asks, um, qu'est-ce que vous voudriez? What would you like? And the client answers, je voudrais un café. So when then the, the script will be written, and the second... Uh, part of my Luc Besson um, impersonation would be that now I'm doing the casting for the film. And um, so now my students are the actors and I would have, they would have to read their dialogue or hopefully not read them, but act them out as if they were, you know, Gérard Depardieu or whoever they want to be, Juliette Binoche or whatever. So they have to order a drink at a cafe and then I film them because I have a very nice camera. It's like this small. <laughs> and um, so then I would ask for volunteers and I would pick three groups. And I'm just going to show you one example of this. Now it's only, it's only the answer, the client. Maybe it's not Gérard Depardieu for this one. It could be Juliette Binoche. Oh, is it here? Hmm. I love technology. <laughs> okay, if it's not cooperating, I'm just going to close it. Maybe this one. Oh. Well, you have the voice, but not the image. <laughs> Let's try again. Ah. There's my student. <laughs> so, 
So there's a casting for Juliette Binoche. There's the second one. Come on. Maybe not. Okay. What about this one? Ah, there we go. That's Juliette Binoche again. <laughs> and then the third one, Gérard Depardieu. Oh, no, still Juliette Binoche? No, that's not the one I wanted. Which one didn't work? This one. Okay, never mind. My Gérard Depardieu doesn't want to cooperate with me. So, after I filmed them, oops, wrong thing. After I filmed them, then I would show the class um, the films and I would involve the whole class by doing a vote. Um, and to do a vote in a bigger class or if you're, if you're teaching in like a room like this where you have, you know, 120 students, um, you may want to think, and we don't have them yet at Armstrong, but maybe if we all want to use them, we'll get them. They're called clickers. Have you heard of clickers? Yes, some of you have. Okay. Um, there, it's what is called the, an audience response system. And there's actually a committee that we just got an email about this for faculty this week. The Educational Technology Committee will host a forum on audience response systems, ARS, on February 25th um, at 12.15 across the, the hall here. But um, I have a small video here of what clickers are. And so it's like when you watch the game Millionaire and you have multiple choice, then all students would have a clicker and they would click on the answer that they think is right. And the information would go directly, everything is linked to the professor's station. And um, the answers, like if, if most students thought it was answer A that was right or whatever, you know, it would show immediately on the screen. And so here's a little video on how that works. See the blue things? and see the result. So, um, that's a nice tool to have. Of course, I don't have a big amphitheater like that full of students. So, a show of hands works just fine. So, um, you've seen my casting for um, Juliette Binoche, right? So, who cares? You know, we, we don't care. Our feelings are not going to be hurt or whatever. So who was the best uh, Juliette Binoche impersonation? Who thinks that film A was? Six. Okay. Uh, film B. Ah, oh, it looks like film B won. I will tell Alida. She's one of our tennis players and she will be very happy. She's also um, the German tutor in the language lab, and she speaks French. So, and the first one was Dr. Rausch, who is here. <laughs> who does not speak French, but spoke French for this occasion. Anyway, so um, once the lesson on food is over and the films are over, then I would have the students go into our lab and practice um, on Skype. Does anyone here not know what Skype is? Okay, it's a free communication system um, online. You can download it at skype.com and anyone who is a uh, who has an account with Skype can communicate for free from computer to computer uh, with another person who is contact who is connected at the same time on Skype. So I've had not this semester, but I've had my students communi communicate with students in France, and so they would exchange um, language practice. We would do the first half in French, where everybody speaks French, and then the second half in English. If you are interested in this and want to practice a language, I recommend that you go to the website um, sharedtalk.com. 
you input your native language and the language you want to practice and then it finds you all the people who are the opposite of you um, and you can you know, e email them first and ask them if they want to practice with you either by email or by Skype or whatever they feel and you feel comfortable with. I did have a little film of a Skype conversation, but we have no time for that. So I will um, skip to the conclusion, if I find my paper with the conclusion on it. Let's see. And of course, it would be impossible to do all of that in one class period. So don't think that I would do that. That would be a few lessons. Okay. So, I believe that all these technological tools, except maybe the pronunciation software, can be used in any classroom for any subject. The two biggest challenges that technology offers are that um, a professor who wants to use technology needs to have access to it. Um, so, either a smart classroom, a digital lab, a multimedia classroom, etc. Teaching in such a classroom is not a given for everyone, as their amount is limited on campus. A technologically enhanced lesson may have to happen on a rotation basis if many professors have to share a single multimedia room. <coughs> Unfortunately, technology does not always work, and that's the second drawback, um, when we want it to. While using technology, professors should always have a backup plan, just in case the technology they wanted to use does not cooperate on a particular day. It is always a good idea to keep images, pictures from magazines, props, and other ancient, ancient tools in one's drawer to avoid a complete blank on any given day. As many of you may know, my area of expertise is medieval French literature, like Lee said that at the beginning, which has nothing to do with languages um, or teaching languages with technology. This is just something I picked up along the way because I realized that it allowed me to expand my classroom walls, even to teach medieval French literature. I can use videos, uh, play medieval music, have my students converse in French with others who are studying the same medieval texts and get different opinions on these texts. Um, there are also many other technological tools that I did not talk about today. But for example, students can meet on a virtual discussion board and comment on each other's findings. And sometimes they congratulate each other um, or point out, point out how deep or not so deep their interpretation of a line or of a text was. I'm ending this presentation with this note just to show you that anyone whatever their background may be, can learn how to use these tools if they want to. It's not a necessity, of course, but sometimes it does make life a lot easier when it works. Thanks again for coming today, and I hope that was interesting for you. Merci beaucoup. Okay, any, do you have any questions? We have about, yes. Is the language lab in the Rosetta Stone I think we can arrange that, yes. Yes. Um, I took French maybe 40 years ago, and my question is, um, do you have a textbook where you teach like reflexive verbs and irregular verbs? I mean, do you ever explain uh, masculine and feminine, and, and do you, why? Yes. Where do you explain that, in the beginning? Or? Well, whenever the chapter is on the reflexive verbs, and that's usually the third um, semester. But yes, I do have a textbook. Um, it's still, you know, it's still the fashion to have a textbook. Um, but it is enhanced with the technology that I use. And so I personally do not stop the class and speak English and say, now we're going to talk about reflexive verbs. And this is how they work, and this is how it works. Uh, my students have the responsibility, they are college students, I probably would not do that in high school, but they're adults, and so they have the responsibility, just like for an English class, to read their lesson before they come to class and do a few exercises on the topic before we actually view it in class. Um, and part of that is possible because each of my classes are divided in three 
parts. The first part is a review of what we did the day before, then the view of what we're doing today, and then a preview of what we will do the next time. So they go into their homework and their next lesson, having seen examples on the board, having done already some activities in class. Um, so, and all the grammar is explained in English in the textbook. Now, if they don't understand what the textbook says, I ask them to come and see me before class so that I can explain it to them or email me so that I can explain it to them through email. But I do not teach the grammar. We use it. That's what class time is for. So. And you never speak English? One word in one class time, maybe. <laughs> they are all fine. <laughs> They actually are very doing very well. <laughs> I, I draw pictures. I'm a horrible artist, but um, if I have the internet, I pull it up on the internet. Or if somebody in the class knows it, then I ask them to say it. If there are any instructions, like uh, in the textbook, if there are instructions in English, I will ask a student to read them. No English is produced by me in the classroom. It's scary at first, I know, but honestly, it works very well. And with all the tools that we have now, especially visuals and everything, it's, it's really not that scary. It's only scary the first 10 minutes. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you again for coming and enjoy the weather. <laughs>